be feeling the effects of it for many, many days to come. The White House and apparent majorities in both houses of the Congress are singing the same songs of praise for the same legislation, a five-year deal to cut taxes and reduce the federal budget deficit to zero. The deal completed last night between White House and congressional negotiators includes a $400 child tax credit beginning next year, rising to $500 per child in 1999. President Clinton had insisted the credit apply to lower income families as well as the middle class. He got his way. Families earning from $18,000 to $110,000 a year will qualify. There will be a cut in the capital gains tax as Republicans had wanted. The tax on profitable sales of stocks, real estate and other assets will fall to 20% for the wealthy, 10% for everyone else. There will be tax breaks for a higher education too. All told, the tax relief comes to $91 billion, but there's also at least one tax increase. By 2002, the cigarette tax will go up 15 cents a pack, with the proceeds going to buy health insurance for 5 million children. At a White House ceremony you saw live here on CNN, Mr. Clinton couldn't find enough good things to say. This agreement is a monument to the efforts that people who goodwill can make when they put aside partisan interests to work together for the common good and our common future. It reflects the values and aspirations of all Americans, and I hope and expect it will marshal strong majorities of both parties in both houses. This summer we had an historic opportunity to strengthen America for the 21st century, and we have seized it. Now our nation can move forward stronger, more vibrant, more united than ever. For that, I am profoundly grateful. Moments later, the top guns in the Republican-led Congress said virtually the same thing. This truly is a great moment. We made a decision earlier this year that we're going to work together to get this victory for the American people. And that's what it's really about. It's not about partisan politics. It's not about who's president or who's in the Congress. It's about returning the government to the people. We have accomplished this with this agreement that we've entered into last night and that we're going to pass through the Congress during the next two days. Now, if all this sounds familiar, you're recalling the handshake deal the two parties reached in the spring? It's taken this long to hammer out the details. It shouldn't take long to pass the bills, though, one for spending, one for taxes. Congressional leaders hope to do it by Friday so they can start their summer vacation. A great incentive for them. More than half the savings envisioned by budget negotiators comes from Medicare. CNN medical correspondent Jeff Levine looks at the deal's bottom line for seniors and seniors-to-be. The budget deal is a far cry from the broad health care reform program President Clinton promised in his first term. Now just keeping Medicare afloat is a top priority. Budget negotiators trim spending growth in this insurance program for seniors by $115 billion over the next five years. Medicaid, which covers the poor, will rise by $13 billion less during the same period. Much of the trimming will come in fees to doctors and hospitals. Lobbyists for seniors successfully prevented major changes that would make their wealthy constituents pay more or raise the age of eligibility for Medicare. I think as long as we're clear about what direction we're moving, there's no need to have a, a one-time revolution in Medicare. But Uncle Sam wasn't all Scrooge. Medicare features additional benefits for tests to prevent serious disease and a number of new coverage options beyond traditional insurance and managed care. Well, the concern is that with all these new choices all being aggressively marketed to seniors, you're going to have the potential for some real confusion out there. <laughs> Lawmakers heard the cry of the nation's 10 million children who don't have health insurance. The budget deal should provide coverage for at least 5 million of them. It will be a $24 billion federal-state program Eight billion will come from a new tax on cigarettes, but there is concern some of the money might not be spent to help kids. We need child advocates and providers and churches and, and religious communities and others out there in the states fighting to make sure that this money is used well. While the changes aren't overwhelming, analysts say they do add up. Well, on the Medicare side, it's small increments. It's really not uh, very important. On the children's side, I think it is really quite significant. But often the budget deal is the question of what to do when the baby boom generation collides with Medicare. And even if the new children's insurance program works perfectly, millions of kids still won't be covered. Jeff Levine, CNN on Capitol Hill. The budget deal even looks ahead to the taxes your estate owes when you're dead.
At that point, you might not care, but your next of kin might want to watch this report from CNN's Steve Young. When someone dies, the estate still has to pay a tax bill. Current law dictates that $600,000 of your estate is exempt from taxes, but any amount above that is subject to a federal tax of up to 55%. This year's tentative budget agreement increases the exemption to $1 million over Thank 10 you, Mr. years. Chairman. Some critics call the proposal a break for the rich, but others say financial circumstances have changed over the years. And I think it's really more for middle and upper income people who, through houses and life insurance and good investing in their retirement accounts, will get to the level where their assets are in that million to $2 million range. The agreement provides additional relief for heirs to family farms and family businesses by increasing their exemption to one and a third million dollars next year. The new bill as it is currently uh, in progress, uh, I think gives a lot of relief to the closely held business owner. Not a whole lot, but it's a step in the right direction. And I think it, it, it shows that Washington is concerned about the closely held family business. Regardless of what happens with the tax laws, there are several ways to structure your estate to lower the potential tax burden. Make sure both you and your spouse take advantage of individual exemptions by keeping some assets in separate names. Give tax-free gifts up to $10,000 per person per year. Set up trusts that effectively remove assets from your estate. And make sure your life insurance policy is owned by someone other than you. Then the proceeds won't be considered part of your estate. That's your money. Steve Young, CNN Financial News, New York. So what's your cut of the budget pie? Find out this evening in a special report on the world today here at CNN. That's 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 Pacific. So what does Wall Street think about all of this? The Dow Jones Industrials hit a new high today, rising more than 53 points, reaching 8,174 at the closing bell. This is the Dow's fifth record high in six sessions. The Nasdaq also had a good day. It rose more than eight points from yesterday to close at the 1,572 mark. What do most Americans think about stock market investments? A new CNN USA Today Gallup poll shows most are bullish and see the market as a good investment. So how many Americans have a stake in the market? 49% of all adults say they do. And 18% of those say they actively trade once a month or more. Only about a third of those surveyed believe a crash is likely next year. 62% say that investing in the market is a good deal if they had $1,000 to spend. That's a dramatic change from 1990 when only 26% believed in the market. As for the 401k retirement program, 39% of all Americans say they take part in their company's stock purchasing plan. Friends, family, and fans are paying a final tribute to one of golfing's greats. Funeral services for Ben Hogan were held today in Fort Worth, Texas. Golfers Sam Sneed, Ken Venturi, and Tommy Bolt were among those serving as pallbearers. During his three decades as a professional golfer, Hogan earned a reputation as one of the greatest ever to play the game. He died Friday at age 84. President Clinton is remembering William Brennan as a legal giant who helped mold the Supreme Court into an instrument of liberty and equality. Mr. Clinton delivered one of the eulogies today during funeral services for the retired Supreme Court Justice. As the leading liberal on the court for 34 years, Brennan is considered one of the most influential judges of the 20th century. He died last week at age 91, but the president says Brennan's legacy will live on. Throughout our history, a few powerful ideals have transformed the lives of our people. And throughout our history, there have been a few individuals so devoted to those ideals, they could hammer them on the anvil of history to reshape our land and our future. Justice Brennan found the ideals and the Constitution time and time again. And time and time again, he stepped into the breach to hammer them on the anvil of our history. Justice Brennan will be buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Are consumers paying too much for convenience? Just ahead here on Early Prime, Congress considers whether to intervene between you and your bank machine. And will this major delivery service be stalled by a strike? We'll have the latest on that as we continue. If you have packages going out this week by way of UPS, listen up. The delivery services contract with the Teamsters Union expires after Thursday. 
There's a strike looming. UPS handles 12 million packages a day. A spokesman says volume already is down over the past week and layoffs are underway. Catalog companies and other merchants are lining up other services. Union and company representatives say they're still far apart on the key issues. Union demands include pay and pension increases and more full-time jobs. Companies 2000 pilots say they'll support a walkout if necessary. The Senate Banking Committee is taking a hard look at fees banks charge for ATM transactions. There are concerns that larger banks may be unduly profiting at the expense of consumers and small banks. Here's CNN's Kathleen Koch. Automatic teller machines have become an expensive addiction for consumers in a hurry. 54% now double charge when money is withdrawn, some as much as $3. Consumers feel trapped. I think they're cheating me. But most banks will not let you use your card unless you agree to pay them. An ATM withdrawal at your own bank costs at about 27 cents. If you make a transaction at another bank's ATM, it costs your bank about 65 or 70 cents. But using a teller costs a dollar seven cents. The Senate Banking Committee wants to know why charges for the less expensive transactions tripled over the last year to $1.2 billion. Are we really having competition eliminated and people not having the choices as a result of the biggest networks coming together, consolidating. Small banks insist bigger banks with lots of convenient ATMs are using the surcharges to drive them out of business. By imposing surcharges, ATM owners are hoping to persuade the customers of other banks to move their accounts to the ATM owner's bank to avoid the fee they are charging. Senator D'Amato has introduced a bill to ban double charging. Larger banks who profit from the fees contend that they help pay for ATMs in remote or expensive locations. But smaller banks who are banding together to offer their customers no fee ATMs say that's baloney. For uh, what I would suggest would be a convenient system of ATMs, no, you don't need surcharges. Still, some in Congress and those running the ATM networks bristle at the idea of the government stepping in to set the price of ATM transactions. We believe that the market should work and, in fact, is working. Emerging technologies are at a critical phase in their evolution. And to, uh, to dampen that, uh, that growth and that positive evolution through price controls would be extremely dangerous. Consumers fed up with fees can always go back to lining up in front of tellers. But with Americans averaging seven ATM withdrawals a month, it could be a hard habit to break. Kathleen Koch for CNN, Washington. What's in the cargo hold of some passenger planes? On rare occasions, oxygen generators show up, according to the FAA. The agency is investigating reports that several hundred generators arrived in the U.S. on board an Air France passenger jet. Oxygen generators were banned from passenger flights after being implicated in that fire on board a value jet plane last year. 110 people were killed when that plane plunged into the Florida Everglades. He is still a cowboy, although he hasn't been a boy for 60 years. While some folks his age are rocking, he's riding and a roping. And you'll meet him when we come back. First, today's allergy forecast. Pollen and mold spore counts are low today, just in the Intermountain West and Southwest. Readings will reach the moderate range along the West Coast, parts of the East Coast, and through the Rockies and Western Plains. High mold spore counts will affect much of the Midwest, the Southeast, and Southern New England. On Wednesday, there's little change. Low counts in the Intermountain West and Southwest, with moderate readings through the Rockies and parts of the East Coast. High levels of mold from the Midwest to the Southeast and Southern New England once again. Now, today's allergy fact. Studies have proven allergenic mold spores are present on all marijuana plants, meaning that people smoking marijuana are also inhaling mold aeroallergens. This is meteorologist Valerie Voss. Allergy Forecast is brought to you by Tylenol Allergy Sinus. Tylenol Allergy Sinus takes care of all your allergy symptoms.
okay, we know already. <laughs> and we all know what happened there. <laughs> yeah, oh well. <laughs> anyway, got your pilot's license, we'll gas up the plane and get on over to Oshkosh, Wisconsin. My gosh, uh, this year 15,000 planes are expected in Oshkosh. From the vintage fighters to the latest ultralights, and CNN will be covering uh, the big show on the ground and in the air tomorrow. Watch for our friend correspondent Jeff Locke's live reports from Oshkosh all day tomorrow, including those on Early Prime. That's 4:30 and then 1:30 Pacific. And I have a feeling we're going to love saying Oshkosh <laughs> yes. all day tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Now let's fly on out to L.A. Here's uh, Jim Murray with our showbiz report. You get to okay. say Oshkosh Bagosh. You mean, yes, right? there you go. They'll Thanks, be sick Lou, of Natalie. us tomorrow. <laughs> Coming up on CNN, are male action film stars getting all sensitive on us? We'll report on that. Plus, in a rare TV interview, the artist formerly known as Prince talks about his battles in the music industry. Those stories and more just ahead on Showbiz Today, but first back to you in Atlanta, Lou and Natalie. So what do you call him when you interview him? Who? That guy formerly known as Prince. You just say, excuse me, sir, formerly <laughs> yeah. known as Prince. Hey, hey you. He calls himself, okay. honestly, he calls himself now the artist. That's gotcha. his now official Excellent. term, the artist. Yes. Okay. Will the real artist please stand up? Now back to the anchors. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> well, in golf, it's not uncommon to see players going strong long after their prime. Ordinarily, that would not include rodeo performers, but today we make an exception. Here's Bob McKenzie of our affiliate KTVU with that story. The Salinas Rodeo draws cowboys, cowgirls, and would-be cowboys and cowgirls from all over the country. And far from fading away, rodeo is growing as a spectator sport, as a televised sport, and as a participatory sport. There are as many horses in the U.S. as there have ever been, about two million of them, and more people learning to ride than ever before. The annual event in Salinas gives the present generation of riders some heroes to emulate. Bareback riding is a simple event. The rider has to stay on the back of a bucking horse for eight seconds. That's it. Of course, simple isn't the same thing as easy. Bronc riders and bull riders are the crowd pleasers here, but people who own and ride horses often appreciate the less hazardous events that have more to do with everyday ranch work. A cowboy and a horse working together in harmony to control a calf, it's a beautiful sight to those who know what's involved. We couldn't meet all the cowboys, so we picked one hero. His name is John Brazil, and he is the oldest man still competing in stock horse events. Brazil is California history walking around. He raises and trains horses on his own cattle ranch in Sonoma County, following the traditional methods of the vaqueros. The leather hackamore he puts on his horse was made by a Spanish craftsman. The rope is woven of horsehair. It doesn't have to be, but that's the traditional way. In 60 years of riding, John Brazil has taken his share of falls, but he's 75 and in fine condition. I've never smoked, and I take a drink or two, but I can't drink very much because the minute I take a couple of drinks, I start to see double and feel single, and it doesn't work out too well. <laughs> yeah. Brazil has raised and ridden many champion saddle horses. Spot Shadow is his favorite horse right now. Training a reigning horse is a slow process, requiring years of daily workouts until horse and rider are so attuned they seem to read each other's minds. How long do you plan to keep doing this? Well, I've been asked that, and uh, the good Lord gives me the help that, he's, that I've endured so far until I feel that I can't stay in balance with the horse. If I feel that I'm a little toppy-turvy, uh, I'll get out of it. No it, sign so far. Huh? No sign so far, thank God. <laughs> right. but no. This rider is Ted Robinson, one of the great competitors with many championships to his credit. The idea is to show complete control over the cow, to keep it in check, to run it where you want it to go. Robinson, like most people in this business, admires John Brazil. He's a great horseman you know i admire all the horses he's trained and i mean he he can take a what we call a bad horse and make him look like he's a hero you know and here are john brazil and spot shadow he says to do this well you have to think like a cow and think like a horse as well as think like a cowboy
If you don't have the reflex, you better get out because you've got to you've got to compensate for what the cow is doing. Well, you got to make decisions in in fractions of a second. Oh yeah. Is but, it automatic or do you think about it? Well, uh, you, you see what's happening and it's becoming automatic. That's where a lot of guys lose it is their reflexes. You got it's got to be snappy. You can't be thinking yeah. about well I'm going to play this card. Or, it's got it's <laughs> got to be instantaneous. Now, in an ideal television world, John Brazil would win this event. But the cow he drew is a difficult one, panicky and headstrong. It bashes into the horse where another cow would steer clear. John and Spot Shadow still perform well, but the choreography is ruined. 7-0, 70 points for John Brazil, 7-0. 70 points, respectable, but not a winner. Well, you have to stand up when you lose, too. If he hadn't told me the co choreography was ruined, I wouldn't have known it. <laughs> and he wears a white hat. Thanks to Bob McKenzie of CNN Affiliate KTVU in Salinas, California. And that is Early Prime. Thank you for watching. I'm Natalie Allen. I'm Lou Waters. Tomorrow here on Early Prime, we'll be checking out some of those aerial acrobatics we told you about with a live report from Jeff Flock at the air show in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. <laughs> By <my> gosh. gosh. <laughs> here we go. Oh, See you tomorrow. Shoot those people. <laughs>